Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for coming. The first of uh, two panels uh, focusing on, uh, on government uh, hacking for surveillance. My name is Tommaso. Uh, I work for Privacy International. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator, and you probably have heard this morning uh, that I need to be mean uh, with my panelists uh, and ask everyone to speak uh, just for no more than five minutes. Uh, now, when we proposed this, uh, this panel, we, we knew that government hacking for surveillance was going to be a, an interesting uh, and, um, and topical sort of uh, issue to, to, to discuss, uh, but we didn't expect to have so many people uh, actually uh, presenting information uh, from a civil society angle on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on how, what they are doing to fight uh, this, this, f this technique, this form of surveillance, which has a uh, unique uh, um, sort of uh, uh, unique risk for, for privacy and for security. Uh, and the reason I'm starting with that is because uh, I would like uh, for you to bear with us uh, and uh, allow first uh, all the panelists uh, to speak for five minutes each, and I'll try to be very strict with that, uh, so that you get uh, a good sense uh, of uh, the various uh, um, government hackings that are taking place uh, in Europe, uh, in Latin America, and then more globally. Uh, and after uh, the, those presentations, we're going to move uh, for a sort of more sort of uh, interactive uh, Q&A where we can kind of uh, uh, discuss matters a little bit more uh, in, in detail. Um, so that's about uh, all I wanted to say to kind of set the scene. Um, some people, some of you may have already the, the actual agenda. But I'll start by asking uh, uh, my colleague Scarlett from Privacy International to talk about uh, uh, hacking uh, in the UK. Thank you. So there's a lot of pressure on me because I have to set a good example with the five minute limitation. So let's see how I do. Um, so our work on hacking actually spans multiple <laughs> jurisdictions. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to first outline developments in the UK related to government hacking. And then I'm going to touch upon some of Privacy International's litigation and advocacy related to hacking. So in the UK, our work on government hacking began with the Snowden disclosures, which revealed that both the NSA and um, the UK's Signals Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, were conducting sweeping hacking operations both domestically and abroad. And in May 2014, we filed a complaint in the UK together with several internet and communication service providers to directly challenge this um, hacking activity by GCHQ. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this litigation in a bit. Um, about a year after the Snowden disclosures broke, the UK government also revealed that for some number of years, law enforcement agencies had also been hacking. Um, and that was the first time that those powers were publicly avowed. Over the course of our litigation, the UK government introduced new framework surveillance um, legislation called the Investigatory Powers Act, um, which went into force uh, late in 2016. And this piece of legislation placed the power to hack, which the UK government describes as equ equipment interference, on explicit statutory footing for the first time in the UK. And the inclusion of those hacking powers in the piece of legislation were a direct result of our litigation. So in the judgment in our case, the court noted that the act plainly drew upon the ideas and submissions openly canvassed in the case. Our position during the debates over the Investigatory Powers Act were that it's unclear whether hacking is ever compatible with international human rights law, and um, also that hacking poses novel security risks. And for both those reasons, there should be a blanket prohibition on hacking in the act. The act, in other words, should not provide a legal basis for hacking. Um, however, we do believe that where governments insist on wielding this, these powers, we would prefer open regulation as opposed to their deployment in secret. Nevertheless, in the UK, the Investigatory Powers Act, um, which now places hacking on statutory footing, um, from our perspective is kind of a litany of horrors um, from an international human rights uh, point of view. And I'm going to highlight a few key areas. So number one, the act permits a wide range of public bodies to hack. So in addition to intelligence and law enforcement agencies, it also permits immigration, tax, and competition markets authorities to hack. It permits what are so-called um, 
targeted and bulk hacking powers, but actually the targeted powers, which are focused on domestic hacking operations, are basically also bulk powers because the government is allowed to seek what it calls thematic warrants, which allows the government to hack broad categories of people, places, or devices. It severs suspicion from a particular individual in the warrant. Um, the act doesn't mandate notification to any subjects of surveillance nor to affected um, service providers or hardware or software vendors. Um, and it also permits governments to compel telecommunications operators to assist in effecting a warrant. Um, and in compelling companies to assist, um, the government doesn't need to s seek a separate warrant in order to do so. It just simply serves a copy of the existing hacking warrant on companies. And companies are um, gagged from communicating publicly about the compulsion to assist in facilitating a hacking warrant. Um, there are a number of other areas, but those are kind of the key, the key notes that I wanted to make about the Investitory Powers Act. Um, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to move into our work. Um, we challenge government hacking through a number of different avenues. We have ongoing direct litigation against GCHQ. We engage in indirect litigation through interventions. Um, so in the last year, we filed a number of amicus briefs in several US federal criminal cases stemming from an FBI operation called Pacifier, which fe featured a watering hole attack on a Tor Hidden Onion service site and affected over 8,700 devices, over 80% of which were located outside the US in over 100 different countries. In addition to litigation, we've engaged in legislative analysis and advocacy, often um, in partnership with a number of the other groups here, and we're very eager to hear more about the work that they're doing. Um, finally, we have a broader project to articulate how the international human rights framework should apply to government hacking, where the governments insist on deploying this power. And um, what we've done is we've actually um, tried to articulate what we believe are 10 necessary minimum safeguards where governments seek to deploy this power or insist on deploying this power. Um, the safeguards are drawn both from the international human rights framework, but also try to integrate some of the security implications of hacking. Um, and we have copies of the safeguards here for anyone who's interested in picking them up. They're up here. Um, and we're very interested um, in having you give us some feedback um, once you've read and digested them. Thank you. Perfect. So five minutes uh, and nine seconds. Very good. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, as I said, uh, hold uh, on, uh, on the questions for later. Um, I'll pass uh, now the floor to Tom from uh, Bits of Freedom Netherlands. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so, uh, unlike in the UK, we don't have uh, one bill for both the police, uh, for both law enforcement agencies and the uh, uh, intelligence services. Um, but uh, both are or will be allowed to hack, probably. Um, so, let's just give you a brief oversight of the Dutch situation. Um, I will start with the police and I will uh, finish with the intelligence services. In 2012, uh, the Dutch uh, Minister of, uh, of, uh, of Justice announced that he, that he wanted to grant the, uh, the power to hack into devices uh, to law enforcement agencies. In 2013, there was an internet consultation um, on what the, we in the Netherlands call the third uh, uh, cybercrime bill, the third, edition, the third edition of the cybercrime bill. And it was sent into, into Parliament in 2015, voted in 2016, uh, and now it's still in the Senate. Um, whenever I look to a to towards a legislative proposal, I always have the, the, the following question. What is it? Why is it? Where is it? And how is this? Uh, so I will, uh, I will follow the same routine when, uh, when talking about this bill. So let's start with the what. Uh, obviously, it's hacking. Um, the Dutch police wants to, wants to be able to hack into, uh, in, in, into uh, automated devices, uh, which is a very broad term, um, which we have uh, heavily uh, uh, lobbied against, but, uh, well, we were basically doomed. Uh, but what is an automated device? An automated device is basi basically anything that you can uh, hook up uh, to the internet, uh, which, as we all know, um, means almost everything today, from a car to a pacemaker to a, a refrigerator to a phone. Um, they'll be able to hack into, the in, 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 into, these, into these devices. Then, of course, the why, because why is it necessary to hack into these kind of devices? The um, Dutch government started in 2012 by saying that, that this was necessary to counter DDoS attacks because DDoS attacks were pre a, a pretty huge problem at the time. Uh, but it evolved from DDoS attacks to uh, obviously fighting child pornography uh, and now uh, to fight terrorism. Um, however, if you look at the bill, it's, uh, it's not just uh, 
fighting these uh, serious crimes, but also fighting uh, basically any cyber crime, uh, but also just gathering e evidence of, uh, of uh, any type of uh, remotely serious crimes. Um, then where, obviously? Well, they want to hack in the, within the Netherlands, but they, they, they will also be able to hack uh, outside the Netherlands uh, if the device, if, if, if the location of the device is unknown, or if, for example, another country doesn't respond to an MLED fast enough or mm -hmm. refuses to respond. And um, well, we have a few uh, a few issues with this bill. Uh, for example, uh, we think that the oversight is lacking, and we have a problem with the um, how they can hack, because. Um, they can hack using uh, via any mean. For example, uh, if they have the, the password, they can log in, obviously. But they, they can also use uh, known and unknown vulnerabilities. And we have a problem with that because we think that that's a, a severe security issue and we really oppose the use of, uh, of zero days of unknown vulnerabilities. We have been campaigning quite heavily on this bill. We have been doing quite some lobbying. And we've been focusing on the scope of the bill, so the, uh, the type of devices which can be hacked, the vulnerabilities and the oversight. It's still, uh, uh, it's still heavily debated in the Senate, and they're still discussing it, which is also the reason why it's there for over a year right uh, now. Uh, and, well, the planning is that they will be voting on this before uh, summer 2018. Then, very short on our intelligence services, because um, <coughs> the story is almost uh, repetitive. Um, the IVD is, uh, that so we have the, the, uh, the IVD and the MVD. Uh, th these are both uh, our uh, intelligence services. And they are allowed to hack uh, since 2002, which was uh, fairly unique at, uh, unique at that time. Um, and basically, they can do the same as, the, uh, as what the Dutch uh, police wants to do. However, uh, from reports from the Oversight Committee, mm -hmm. they say the say day, we know that they have been uh, hacking uh, quite broadly. For example, they've been taking over a social media forum, which the Oversight Committee deemed, uh, well, not proportionate. Um, mm -hmm. But they have been... Um, Exploring uh, the law, basically. So if they say they've been doing a very broad, uh, broad interpretation, and um, in a new bill, because there's a new bill which uh, um, is part, partly, partially into force, and the other part <coughs> will be probably into force uh, in May 2017. It's called the WIF 2017. Um, and apart from dragnet surveillance, the, uh, there will also be, s uh, be some parts on hacking. For example, they will now be allowed to hack via third parties which means that if someone has a technical connection or basically he knows uh, a target, then the uh, IVD is allowed to uh, step through, basically. So they're allowed to um, send, to, to hack me in order to hack to myself, for example. Um, what are we doing on this bill? We also have been campaigning heavily, doing FOIA requests, and uh, now there will be a referendum, a non-binding referendum in the Netherlands on the 21st of March 2018, where everybody who is allowed to vote uh, can speak, uh, uh, can give his opinion on the vote, well, uh, on the bill, it will be yes or no, but it will be a very interesting time. Uh, and we're also preparing uh, some litigation against this bill because we think that this is uh, this will not stand. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, moving on to Italy uh, with the uh, Hermes Center, Fabio. Yeah, you're over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, um, try to be short enough. So in Italy, we have uh, mafia, uh, a lot of organized crime, also on Drang and Sacra Colonita. This means that uh, uh, security agencies uh, are, were trying to use any kind of investigatory tool available. And so the first case that has been known of use of Trojan, it's like uh, 12 years ago. And uh, this is the case that uh, reached the, the Supreme Court a couple of years ago, uh, where the judges uh, had to rule out because of the political sensi sensitivity of this that uh, well you know anti-mafia department uh, can use trojan but only to acquire uh, uh, surrounding environmental listening through the microphone of the electronic device so the supreme court judges basically made a piece of the law by an interpretation of the existing uh, environmental listening law uh, already defined by the criminal procedural code uh, in the meantime, three years ago, myself personally, together with some computer forensic experts, MP and lawyer, tried to make a bill proposal that in a comprehensive way tried to regulate the use of Trojans. Uh, but we were un unlucky, even if the process were quite, uh, um, I mean, 
uh, a good process in trying to regulate the use of Trojan by looking at uh, the existing equivalence of the information collection into the existing criminal procedural code. So government hacking doesn't mean acquiring everything that's on the device, but acquiring uh, a file or recording audio or intercepting internet connection or uh, would, would uh, use a different criminal procedural code uh, existing article. But unfortunately, uh, in the government, uh, uh, the government decided uh, to go through a complete rewrite of the existing criminal procedural code, and an MP made an amendment that basically were a cut and paste of the Supreme Court uh, decision that, uh, well, with a Trojan you can do environmental listing with a microphone, but only where in the place where the crime is being committed. Um, so it means that for uh, usual criminals or organized crime that commit crime uh, even when they are in the toilet, uh, the microphone can stay open up uh, uh, 24 hours a day. But for non-usual criminal, well, the microphone can only stay open based on geofencing on the place where the crime is being committed. So what's happening is that uh, the judicial system is making law. It's making the law. And actually, there are other cases uh, that are very sensitive politically, known as Occhionero Brother, that were doing uh, uh, espionage for Masonic power group in Italy, uh, where the fundamental topic of their judgment uh, that is going to reach the Supreme Court is related to the collection of the screenshot on the mobile devices and on computer devices. But the law doesn't explicitly allow you to make a screenshot using a Trojan. So uh, once again, the Supreme Court is going to rule out, uh, most probably, in favor of, uh, well, you know, collecting Trojan, uh, uh, collecting screenshot, uh, I it's good. So what's happening in Italy is that uh, case by case, that are case that are nationally relevant, uh, they, uh, the, 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 the security agencies use the Trojan, and then uh, when they reach the Supreme Court, they get legitimized piece by piece. One important thing to know is that when the Trojan is not defined by as a legitimate tool, including all of the uh, possible limitation existing, they are used anyway, because during the preliminary investigative phase, being an atypical tool, it's very easy for a prosecutor to get a general authorization from the preliminary authorization judge, so uh, get a warrant, uh, to collect uh, uh, elements that will not be possible to be used in court, but well, if you know that this file is on this computer, on that, that specific folder, uh, well, you can, uh, during the preliminary investigative phase, collect it using the Trojan, that's an atypical tool, and then using a, a normal search and seize or warrant, uh, oops, you know the password, or you are skilled enough uh, to be able to crack the encryption, you can get the file with a common, uh, with a common search and seizure. And that way, they bring uh, the evidence to the court. So this is a general framing of what's happening in Italy, actually. Thanks a lot. Um, Felix from La Quadratura United yeah. on France, please. Yes. Um, so, briefly before I start, uh, a word uh, about, the, about the history, because um, I recently found out that um, French intelligence agencies have been conducting hacking for a very long time and actually one of the reasons why the French hacker scene uh, never institutionalized in the 80s like did for instance the German hacker scene around the Chaos Computer Club in, in other countries, the Netherlands for instance, is because in France the, the scene was infiltrated by intelligence agencies to the point where with double agents, agents and a lot of things that make it, made it um, unable to organize. Uh, and actually, hackers would uh, be blackmailed by the intelligence agencies to uh, conduct hacking operations on behalf of, of the French state. Wow. Um, a word about the exist current legal framework, um, first regarding intelligence ag agencies. Uh, we first learned about the hacking operations uh, conducted by uh, today's uh, intelligence agencies in, in 2014 when Le Monde, the newspaper based on the Snowden, Snowden Archive, uh, revealed that the Canadians um, intelli intelligence agencies had found two malwares that they attributed to uh, the DGSC, the French uh, Directorate General for External Security. Uh, and so that's how we learn about, uh, that's the only instance actually we know of where the French uh, uh, agencies have been shown uh, or uh, suspected of using hacking uh, techniques. Uh, and they were actually the, the legal framework regarding surveillance in France by intelligence agencies was 
almost non-existent until 2015 when uh, the Intelligence Act was passed in Parliament after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, the bill, the act, now uh, contains uh, two provisions on the hacking uh, in the code of uh, internal security. And so basically it's a very broad language uh, where any data that is stored, displayed on, the, users, on the, the computer screen, entered on key keystrokes are received or transmitted through um, uh, or by uh, peripherals devices uh, can be can be uh, uh, grabbed uh, through keyloggers and uh, Trojan horses and uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, spywares. Uh, and the the laws says that these very intrusive techniques can only be used when other um, intelligence gathering techniques cannot be used or have been proved to be uh, unavailable. Um, and so that's a small safeguard and otherwise. Uh, the normal safeguards attached to domestic surveillance are applicable. So authorization by the prime minister, there is uh, some kind of oversight by, by uh, an, an oversight agency. Um, but where the law is very lacking is on inter what is called, what we could call, the law doesn't use the la that language, but the international hacking. So hacking for uh, computers, <coughs> machines that are located outside of uh, French borders. In that case, the law actually in inserts in the criminal code, uh, a blanket immunity for intelligence officers doing hacking on machines located abroad. So, and and not only that, there is no legal, uh, no safeguards whatsoever. So, no authorization scheme, no uh, oversight, no redress procedure available for uh, these forms of hacking. Um, and in terms of uh, judi judicial investigations, uh, they were legalized in 2000 2011. Um, and basically, the, the, these, um, these uh, devices or these uh, new tools for investigations have never been used so far for a bunch of reasons. Uh, legal, because the implementation decree was never released until mm -hmm. two years ago. Uh, economic reasons, because all the spyware uh, seemed too expensive to be, to be used. Um, and, and only now is uh, the government creating a new unit tied to the DGSI, which is the uh, intelligence agencies for internal security. Uh, but is also competent for, in some cases, for uh, some ju judicial investigations. And so they will be uh, buying, developing, and maintaining uh, spywares to be used for uh, judicial investigations. And in terms of uh, the work we've been doing, so of course a lot of uh, lobbying against the Intelligence Act, and now we're at the litigation phase where we have uh, pending challenges before the French Council of State, the highest uh, Supreme Court for administrative law in France. And uh, we're challenging the domestic surveillance based on the lack of safeguards which are, it's the same for the, all of the surveillance techniques uh, legalized by the law. And for international hacking, lack of safeguards also under the ECHR and the Budapest Convention, uh, and especially Article 32 of the Convention that we're trying to mobilize um, uh, in this context. Um, and that's it, we don't have anything going on on the judicial uh, hacking. Thank you, thanks a lot. Um, so the last one uh, on uh, the Europe side, uh, before we move to Latin America, is uh, Fukami from uh, Germany. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Fukami from CCC. So I'm just giving a quick overview of our like, history. So uh, in, in um, some sort of like uh, attacking electronic systems exist since like 1979, as far as I understand uh, it used to be inside the law for the federal police. Um, there were fought several battle, uh, battles over it. Uh, um, the most notable, the one in 2008, which gave us uh, something uh, called the fundamental right to confidentiality and integrity in, integrity in information technology systems. But uh, unfortunately, it never really caught up by, by anything. Um, the term that is used in Germany, because it's very broadly discussed, uh, is basically like from the, from the from government side, uh, the terms are basically uh, online search and remote forensics. Um, and for, from the civil society or from the public, it's uh, state Trojan, uh, federal Trojan or police Trojan. I find it very interesting because, you know, like phrasing is an important thing. 
Um, last year, there was actually an important change uh, in the um, in the code of criminal procedure. This is where they, I think it's very similar to Italy, where they put all of the uh, legal ways to um, attack systems into the way how you convey, um, uh, like, uh, um, try to, to, to uh, figure out about um, legal uh, things, like, for example, so it uh, um, includes treason, child pornography, murder, uh, human trafficking, gang, gang theft. So it's a really a broad wain, range of uh, possible serious crimes. Um, it also includes uh, narcotics, as, uh, certain parts of asylum law, uh, weapon trade, and international criminal law. Um, <laughs> it's only again uh, allowed against the accused, with a couple of exceptions that are that are not really enough. Um, and the law explicitly said it is generally allowed even if there is a third party involved that has nothing to do with it. So it's a general, a very broad um, allowance. And the government thinks that online search automatically allows uh, the, the intelligence communities to have everything that they already have, but this is also something that applies to them. Um, the whole law is challenged by uh, the GFF, uh, which is the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte, that's GFF, that's the right word? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> him. Um, and they are chatting, uh, uh, they are preparing an appeal uh, in front of a constitutional court, which is a, a very, like, yeah, that's the way that, that everything is done. Um, and uh, the same is actually for, so Germany has lots of um, local states, they all, roll their own or they buy the same malware that's like the other strain of the story it's like um so over the time um several groups including ccc found um malware used by the police in germany um <coughs> or by the or by the customs um and uh yeah it's like it, it always sparks a big discussion there was also like uh, um, yeah, like uh, uh, that they are also um, uh, what they call untersuchungsausschuss, um, untersuchungsausschuss, uh, inquiry committee, inquiry committee. <laughs> exactly um, about the NSA mm -hmm. spying, but also like for all of those um, things. So, so it's a it's a big uh, public discussion, but at the end uh, we still have a very very bad law. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so far from Germany. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, for the, the part uh, where we're going to look at uh, sort of <coughs> practices in Latin America, Catiza is going to give us uh, a broad uh, uh, overview, and then uh, we have uh, Luis uh, to talk uh, more about the experience uh, in Mexico, and uh, Maria for, uh, for, for no, Colombia. Um, yeah, you just talked. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Tommaso. Um, so I will. Uh, talk a little bit about what we have been doing in Latin America. We did a survey of privacy law in 13 countries in the region. Um, one of the premise was try to understand what was the legal authority, if any, about using hacking tools. Um, uh, we knew for, the for many leaks that, for instance, many countries were using, in the region were using uh, hacking teams uh, of different uh, gamma products of uh, Hacking teams products like in 2013 we knew that in Panama and Mexico was having it, and then we have Venezuela and Paraguay in 2015, and um, before we have all hacking team leaks that reveal that Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Honduras, Panama uh, purchase a lot of uh, hacking teams licenses. And also we learned through the hacking team leaks that many other countries like Argentina, Guatemala, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, were uh, starting negotiating with them. Then uh, Citizen Lab uh, disclosed a very big report about an extensive malware campaign, a phishing campaign, and a disinformation campaign happening in what is called the ALBA countries, like the Bolivian alternative to the Americas, which is Ecuador, Argentina, Venezuela, and Brazil, in which uh, there were uh, a series of sponsor or sponsors 
who have a regional and political interest. They were targeting political oppositions and independent journalists in, the, in those countries. Um, we knew, thanks to the report of the Citizen Lab, the, the attackers, they called Pakrat, they were not able to identify exactly who were the attacker, but they knew that um, they were targeting uh, Nisman, which was a, a politician, in, a prosecutor in, in Argentina, who was found dead because he was uh, researching a bombing attack from a Jewish center in, in that country, in Argentina. Um, they found a malware, a malware in their phone, although the phone was not infected because the malware was tagged into their computer. Um, they found that this same malware was used to another Argentinian, news, uh, Argentinian um, journalist, and they later found that the same malware was used in, in Ecuador. Uh, and they were able to track to a series of attacks that were happening in those countries with cloning websites for infecting oppositions or creating fake websites of opposition, opposition websites to target the opposition, uh, the independent journalists, even judges in those countries. So we knew for the fact that they were using it. Uh, and so when we do the comparative analysis, one of the arguments that we found for the politicians was that they were using these, the legal authorities were using these, these uh, tools were the interception of communications. Of, of course, we don't believe interception communication is a legal authority to do this kind of, of malware, but that was what, for instance, in the press in Chile said one of the prosecutors. So we went and reviewed some of the legislation on some of the countries, and we found that, for instance, in Chile, Paraguay, Guatemala, Honduras, and Uruguay, there are really huge loopholes that if you want, you can interpret that some way that these, the use of these technologies and any future technology, because they said that they can do interceptual communication with any kind of technology that exists now or could be exist in the future. Uh, and they said, and they open a real loophole of what they can do with interceptual communication, which is not limited <coughs> only listening to someone who are tapping. Um, so we were very surprised. One, the worst countries where we found this kind of le legislation was in Central America, like Honduras and Guatemala, who are one of the worst countries with this kind of very broad pra powers. Um, we also found that in many of the countries survey, um, um, some of them have uh, purchased illegally the software. So entities who have not legal authority to survey were actually buying the software. And I think uh, Luis may or may not talk about a little about Mexico on that front, but this is one of examples. We also found um, the use of malicious, uh, malicious software to target poli politicians and opposition parties. We also found that, for instance, um, Brazil has a law that, pro uh, that allow authority to have uh, to not publish <coughs> binding uh, biddings, so authorities can buy surveillance technology without disclosing that they are buying surveillance technology and they are protected under the law. So even if you do want to do FOIA request <coughs> or something, you cannot. They are protected. So I don't know. Um, finally, uh, we also found that, for instance, in Paraguay, um, there were also another case when the journalists were actually finding, uh, finding um, invoices about the use of these uh, tools in countries and the, the government were denying, but then they were accept that they were just using malware for geolocalization, but nothing else, according to them. Um, the report is online and you can find it in the Necessary Proportionate website. They are in English and in Spanish. And there are country reports and a comparative analysis if you want to read more about it. Thank you, Pinsel. Um Moving on to more specific on Mexico with Luis from r So, uh, as Carita briefly mentioned uh, a little bit about this, but I'll, I'll delve into it. Um, in Mexico, there's no specific law about hacking or allowing hacking by authorities. However, uh, apparently, or what we know is that uh, authorities are interpreting a broader lawful intercept authorization to try to do hacking. Um, 
So far, we haven't detected that the government has the capability to develop their own hacking tools. So they rely on buying and using commercial spyware uh, products. When they are relying on, on lawful intercept uh, uh, concept, uh, in theory, it means that you need a judicial warrant. And uh, after a litigation case that we brought uh, <coughs> after a tele telecommunications law in Mexico, it was uh, the, the agency that are allowed to do lawful intercepts has been limited very uh, uh, importantly. So there's basically three agencies that can do lawful intercept and technically hacking according to their interpretation. Mm -hmm. The first indications that there was hacking in Mexico were after a report by the Citizen Lab regarding Finn Fisher that found that command and uh, 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 command center control, I, I forgot the name, uh, command, in center. command center, yeah, remote centers. In, in Mexico. And then the hacking team leaks revealed that Mexico was their biggest client of hacking team, both on how much money was spent and also the number of authorities that acquired hacking team software. Um, and there's strong indications that this, this, and this is the problem of hacking, even though the law technically, even under the interpretation of, of, of Mexican authorities, uh, you have to get a warrant to use it. In reality, since you, you don't have to ask permission or collaboration from anyone to use those tools, there's a lot of incentives to use them without uh, going uh, uh, to a court. And there's strong indications that this is what happened. For example, there's one state in Mexico, a local authority, that purchased hacking team uh, software. We have a broad permanent campaign of transparency uh, que uh, questions that we, that we ask to authorities to try to map how surveillance is, is used in Mexico. And for example, this state that acquired hacking team has only in three years asked a court for a lawful intercept uh, authorization three times. So there's there's uh, two options. Either they spent so much money on buying this very fancy tool that you just used three times, or they're using it without a warrant. And we're just giving them the benefit of the doubt that these three times they use hacking team and not other like normal wiretapping operation that you ask the, the, the telecommunication company to, to allow you to listen to someone's calls, etc. Uh, and this is numbers that the, the prosecutor of, of this state, the state of Jalisco, said uh, that they ask. When we ask the courts, they don't have any record on any request made by that prosecutor. So there's all this mess around. Then um, we were suspicious about NSO uh, malware being uh, used in Mexico, and I don't have so much time to talk about the investigation and all the time we took and all the learnings that we have, maybe later or over a beer, preferably. Um, we cannot talk about that, but uh, Basically, after the investigation, we found actual victims of hacking in Mexico. Uh, journalists, human rights defenders, opposition politicians. We have been able to uh, detect more than 100 SMS messages that were attempting to infect uh, uh, people with an, uh, NSO malware. This was a big scandal. It was in New York Times. The president threatened us to sue us, and then he backtracked, stuff like that. You can read a lot about that, but we found actual victims, and that has created a great uh, opportunity for reform, for change, and for, for to get this issue out of the shadows in Mexico. So what we're doing after all these investigations and, and, and what, what's going on in Mexico, there's a criminal investigation in which we're part of. We're representing the victims of, of this targeting. The Data Protection Authority has also launched an investigation based on, on, on our investigation. Uh, the Human Rights Commission of Mexico as well is doing an investigation uh, for human rights violations. There's, we're working and pushing for legal reform in Mexico. There's a lot of things that we've been talking about. The document that Paris International has, has brought up raises some of the questions that the, or some of the proposals that we're trying to get uh, installed into the law. Our position is as well that hacking is not compatible with uh, human rights in general, but if you're going to do it, you should do it uh, in, right this, at least in this manner. Right? <laughs> and um, also, there's a lot of transparency litigation that we're doing to try to, to get more information on who has this commercial spyware uh, 
how they're interpreting the, the laws that uh, authorize them, or that they think they authorize them to use hacking, but also how courts are, are interpreting the laws that are supposed to be authorizing hacking, because all of this is still uh, very opaque. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, last one about Latin America is uh, Maria from uh, Cecilia, Colombia. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in Colombia we have mainly three types of lawful communication surveillance. So first we have the insert interception of communications. That is basically when you have a judicial process, you need a written warrant from the general prosecutor. You need to have a subsequent judicial control in order to validate the legality of the action. Then you also have a second type of uh, communication surveillance that is the selective search in databases. And it's bas it basically has the same safeguards, but in this case, you need a previous control of a judge. And finally, you have something called the monitoring of the electronic spectrum. We don't really understand what this is. They have a very broad definition, but basically the only thing we know is that they need to have a duly established operational order you know, in order to proceed. But the thing is that in Colombia we have these lawful um, means of surveillance, but our um, intelligence agencies are purchasing surveillance technologies that go beyond that. So on the one hand, we have like the legal system that is called Esperanza, and is basically a communication inter interception system that is connected to the telecommunication providers, and it goes case by case. Uh, between its safe, wo safe words, you have that an electronic warrant is needed and a subsequent judicial control is also needed. But you have two other systems of bulk surveillance. The first of them is called Puma and is a phone and internet monitoring system. And basically they have a proof that collects <coughs> like massive information that go through the electromagnetic spectrum. And the other one is IRS, it's called Integrated Recording System, and it monitors massive communications traffic. And on the other hand, you have hacking tools. So what we have in Colombia is called Galileo, and it's basically a remote control system. It was bought by the Colombian state from hacking team, but through an intermediary company. And it is an intrusion system, maybe you know about it, that can be used to hijack computers, to copy data, uh, to delete files, to turn on and off the camera and the microphone. So the thing is that we have no legal framework that allows our enforcement authorities to use this type of technologies but they are using them. So basically, it is an illegal use of, of these capabilities. And it is more <coughs> evident that it is illegal because since 2009, we have a law that criminalizes activities such as abusive access to a computer system, computer data interception, or the use of malicious software. But the thing is that we have no enough oversight systems of surveillance. So on the one hand, we have a data protection regulator that has no competence over the intelligence agencies. So they can see what the government is doing, but when talking about intelligence agencies, they can say nothing. And on the other hand, we have an independent commission that was created within the Congress to oversee the intelligence activities, but they even though the, the law was issued in 2013, they are not working now because they are waiting for the intelligence agencies to approve the members of the commission. Um, so finally, we have had a lot of uh, scandals of surveillance that have been denounced by journalists because normally uh, we have no uh, judicial prosecutions on these issues. But the last of all these scandals was related with a group of journalists that were researching on a ring or a network of gay uh, prostitution within the national police. And one of these journalists saw how his um, mouse was moved by someone else and he actually deleted the file in which he was working on. 
So that's what we know, and we have no prosecution for these issues. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the last one of our speakers uh, before we open the floor to questions is uh, Lucy from uh, Access Now. Thank you. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, I almost feel bad that I'm um, have to have to close this because there have been so many arguments. I already have questions, <laughs> um, but I'll I'll take up some more time and I'll talk. And please give me a note at three minutes because I need two minutes at the end and I'm worried about having to squeeze that into 20 seconds. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lucy and I work at Access Now. I think most of you are familiar with our work, but I just wanted to say a little bit of intro because I think it relates um, to what I will say about government hacking. Um, we work, basically, I'm a member of the policy team. Um, we also have an advocacy team which runs um, our big campaigns like Keep It On and others that you may have seen and you may be familiar with. And we have our tech helpline, which basically is a 24-7 um, helpline that's there to help uh, activists, human rights defenders, regular citizens, generally anyone. They're based in Manila, uh, Tunis, and Costa Rica, and they're there to provide all kinds of help. Um, so they've done everything from preventative cases, helping people set up PGP, to really reactive cases of people turning over, you know, applications to us that they suspected were infected um, with government malware or um, more complex issues, which then also go to our legal counsel and um, we deal with them. Um, so that uh, that tech line is there, and it's one of the uh, ways that we've been engaged with government hacking. It's one of the ways that government hacking has been brought to our attention in different parts of the world. Um, from our community. Um, we then take that and we try to reflect on that on a policy level and try to identify some like low and high hanging fruits that we can tackle in the, in the policy sphere. Um, and it's been quite difficult as um, has been portrayed here. So my role is to campaign on this issue on the, e, uh, on the EU level, mostly because I'm based in Brussels. Um, this has been reflected in some of the EU files uh, some of you might be familiar, um, uh, it's e-evidence, we have had export controls which we've been working on, which is very much um, tied to some of the work that has been said here because a lot of this technology originates actually from Europe um, in a big way and um, data retention. Um, and then of course my role is also to bring this to international for already, oh my gosh, <laughs> I talk so much. Um, and one of my other <laughs> roles is to bring this to the appropriate international fora. So we've engaged in the IGF Best Practice Forum on this. Um, I went to GCCS also to have this discussion um, with uh, governments at a really high level, um, and it's a very hard thing to tackle. So for us, encryption um, was a big part of our core work for many years. We spoke about, um, we had a campaign called Secure the Internet, encrypt all, and encrypt all the things, um, and this was a big core of our work. And so our interest in hacking actually at that time um, was triggered by what we were hearing both at uh, the Europol level at the Commission level and globally, and that was that governments were moving a little bit from trying to argue with the digital community about encryption because it's become so stigmatized and so publicized, and they started <laughs> moving more towards, you know, just incognito, looking at cybercrime and looking at hacking and looking at how to how to frame this as, oh, it's not against, it's not about your privacy, it's about the security of the state, and I think that's a lot of um, mm -hmm. a lot of where that's shifted, and I think it's a problem that we to focus just on government hacking and ignore the fact that inherently it's the same issue that we're having with government. They've just chosen a slightly different forum uh, to have it in. That's a little bit more convenient to their narrative. Um, oh wow, I am not even halfway, Jesus. Okay, well I'll skip through. But basically what we did, uh, we wrote a paper, so if you want to have a look, accessnow.org, you can look at government hacking. There's a really nice succinct three-page version and a long paper. Um, but we didn't want to just look at government hacking in terms of surveillance, because that's definitely an issue. It's an issue that we've seen around the world. But we also identified um, that hacking exists in ter for governments, especially in terms of messaging control, um, as well as causing damage to targets. So when we looked at this, we also we looked at these three categories and how they're impacted. Um, so we identified 10 safeguards. Do, do, damn, okay, one minute. <laughs> we identified uh, 10 safeguards, but addi in addition to these safeguards, of course, um, you know, it's, there's much more necessary from a human rights perspective. In the report, we concluded that there should be a presumptive ban on government hacking because A, we don't know half enough that we need to know about the activity. We know only from leaks and, and um, this kind of information. And B, uh, because simply the current practices that some of which have been outlined so strongly interfere um, with human rights. Um, and also one of the things that we mentioned is the judicial authority authorizing activity has to consider um, an entire range of potential harm, right? Um, 
so the operation um, uh, of these tools in relation to actual cybersecurity as a whole uh, of not just of the um, individual but of the organization they're part of or the community or the entire infrastructure can be compromised by government activity and that's actually what we've been seeing in recent years in terms of um, the exploits that governments have been holding on to been causing massive harm to the cybersecurity environment. <sighs> okay, so I'll end there. <laughs> I really wanted to go through the safeguards, but I'm, for the sake of conversation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there. And I hope that you guys have questions about this. Thanks Thank for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for keeping uh, everyone really. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to propose, so let's have a round of applause because uh, it's been very good uh, and also in terms of the timing. We have around uh, 35 minutes uh, for uh, a more interactive. Thank you for your patience, but I thought uh, it would be useful to get this uh, general sense of where, uh, where we stand in terms of understanding of government acting for surveillance. Um, now, the next uh, 35 minutes is really more for, uh, for questions and maybe start looking at uh, strategies that have been used um, and I would like to maybe start the first uh, round of questions or comments uh, around strategies that civil society can use uh, to unmask uh, government hacking for surveillance. I think there have been already some, uh, some uh, interesting points about uh, the need to um, use uh, like uh, citizen lab type of reports that have disclosed information or um, Mexico R3D has done its own research uh, and I'm sure there are others uh, including through litigation as a way to kind of unmask uh, the actual capacity of, of governments to um, uh, yeah, to kind of carry out the government acting for surveillance uh, but uh, I would really hope uh, people yes please uh, thank you very much for the presentation um, I have could you just say your name and, and give away your yes, phone? I'm uh, Julian Rossi from the University of Technology of Montana. Thank you. Uh, there. Um, and my question is actually uh, regarding uh, the word you're using, uh, government hacking, and to make sure I understand it right, uh, mm -hmm. what is the, where, where would you point the difference between classical electronic surveillance by government and government hacking? Is there a, a difference, or is it a new way a new strategy to frame uh, this type of, of electronic surveillance? And if so, uh, is it, uh, it's perhaps a provocative question, but is it a good <laughs> idea to talk about government hacking as something bad when we know that other civil society organizations, I'm thinking about the Curse Computer Club especially, but uh, it can be uh, other hacker spaces and so on, uh, are uh, trying to uh, s struggle for the recognition as hacking as a legitimate um, uh, activity. So, uh, yeah. So, is it so? If if, hack, if we if hacking is legitimate, then when is it not legitimate for governments to do it? And uh, it seems to be. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm curious about where what clarification can be on that. <coughs> um, since you mentioned CCC, I would uh, I, I take this okay. sure. <coughs> so 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 first of all, we are not talking about government hacking. We use the word Trojan. Mm. Um, I think we use the word Trojan. Um, and that's, uh, uh, although it also doesn't really fit 100% what they do, um, it's a framing. And the government hacking part, I see it exactly like you, that's really an uh, unfortunate name. This is like something that I would have to discuss, that is really not a good, a good uh, phrase. Because mm -hmm. hacking in general is not what, you know, like, it is, like, at least in Germany, hacking has a good connotation. Yeah, so, and you're absolutely right. So for many people I know say yeah, it's, it's, it's great, they come up with, with fancy idea to catch criminals. But this is not how that really works. This is, tro this is trojanizing uh, technology in order to get uh, more access to everything. So this is really a different thing. So um, I agree completely. Tom? Uh, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, 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 if I just may, uh, like the, the, the exercise we have done in Italy from, for the uh, bill proposal, it's about computer capturing, not about hacking, because hacking anyhow, it's about uh, uh, hacking, breaking into some security measure. But for example, what we found out during uh, uh, inquiries in, um, I mean, collaborative ways with the uh, anti-mafia <laughs> department uh, and cyber police and so on, asking about the bill proposal, if the, they were posing 
problem or not, uh, how you deliver the Trojan on the target device usually, and the answer is, uh, well, the electrician that goes uh, placing a micro bag and video bag, they also have a USB sticks and other equipment uh, to place the computer bag, mm -hmm. if there's a computer bag in the room or in the place where they need to put it. So most of the feedback that we got is that uh, placing a Trojan and capturing information from a phone or computer doesn't involve hacking. It, it can also, but most investigation doesn't involve it. Um, sure. And just as an addition to uh, what was said on the CCC, the CCC did an um, amendment uh, in addition to the um, hackers ABIT uh, about uh, 20 years ago. And it means a uh, little mess in uh, other people's data. The special amendment is not part of the casual hacker ethics. And how can people explicitly edit that? Yeah, I just want to say a couple of um, things in response to the first question. So, Privacy International's perspective is that hacking in general often has extremely positive connotations. It evolved from a desire by the security and tech community to solve problems creatively. Mm -hmm. um, it's evolved um, to <coughs> often mean um, using that experimentation to discover flaws in our software and hardware and to fix them. The main distinction between that type of hacking and government hacking in the surveillance context is that in the surveillance context, governments hack, and what we mean by that is that they interfere with systems, often in ways um, that are meant to perpetuate the insecurity of those systems to facilitate a surveillance objective. Um, and that's predominantly the reason that we've decided to focus, at least in the first stage of our work on hacking, on the surveillance context, because the objective there is obviously very different. Um, we've struggled a lot with the definition uh, of, what, of hacking, because it's um, very difficult to define. It can mean very different things in different contexts, different communities use it different ways, and we're still um, very much exploring um, our use of that word, and we really welcome feedback um, as to whether or not it's appropriate. But um, what we've sort of settled on at the moment is that we think of hacking as an act or a series of acts which interfere with the system, causing it to act in a manner unintended or unforeseen by the manufacturer, user, or owner of that system. Now again, that can be positive in certain connotations, but in the surveillance context, that interference is, the purpose of that interference is to facilitate a surveillance objective. It's not in order to determine what the flaws of that system are and then to test those flaws and to fix them. It's purely to facilitate surveillance. And in that context, we think that there's an extreme tension between securing systems and um, using hacking um, to facilitate surveillance. Uh, an additional note. So um, there is one really important lesson uh, lesson into this uh, in order to uh, how to influence the public. Mm -hmm. So because you know uh, what what he asks is really brilliant in terms of you know like that that we mess with our own um, uh, framing of things and that we contradict uh, things that work elsewhere in a different way. So if you start to campaign in Germany and you use that term. This has a devastating effect. Yeah. We need to understand this. Mm -hmm. This is no air. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I think we don't use hacking or hacking. We just more use more <coughs> government use um, government uh, government use of malware or government attacks. You know, or, or, or government use of malware. That's how we usually refer to, and probably because we work with the hacking community, and we will be very uncomfortable using the word hacking. Um, but that's like a very minor point. Felix, yeah, I was wondering w why don't you use computer network exploitation, which yeah. is another <laughs> <laughs> name. Yeah. Or remote <laughs> access <laughs> control. <laughs> <laughs> I, think the re I think the reason there is that we try in general not to perpetuate the terms that the governments use, yeah. um, often because it's a way to either confuse or whitewash what they're doing. So 
I mean, actually, the term. But this is even worse because you use a term that we use as with, with a yeah. with a, uh, yeah. a positive connotation to use it in a negative connotation, but, like the governments do. But for, this is but for <laughs> example, in the U.S., the government uses the term computer network exploitation, and there are a lot of advocates for that reason that don't use that term to describe yeah. what's happening yeah. because they do not want to use a term that's being used by the state. Yeah. We government use of malware. Tom. Yeah, so I just want to add that, uh, so for us it's just about remotely accessing a device. Yeah. And we've been talking about, well, we've been calling it the hacking proposal for the last six years now. <laughs> um, but it's also, I mean, I do, I totally get the point, right? And I, I've been struggling with this for years. But on the other hand, um, the large public just understands uh, a hacking proposal or police hacking. They immediately understand what it means. But, um, We've also missed swifting, shifting ever so slightly to, uh, for example, uh, police malware, because nobody wants to have malware. So saying that, the, <laughs> that there's police malware. It is what it is. Yeah, so it is what it is, yes. Um, but I agree, the terminology is very important. So thank you for your question. Yeah, uh, okay, well you stole some of my thoughts, thanks. But um, <laughs> uh, actually uh, what I also wanted to add is, uh, and this is what I saw especially at the EU level, is um, that the reference wasn't just hacking, but they were using lawful hacking intrinsically for any activity that involved the government. And this is something that baffled my mind when I first sat um, in the room with um, you know, Microsoft and the Commission and, and some of the member states. Because the, the reference was, well, yeah, when states conduct lawful hacking. And I was like, whoa. Just because a state is doing it does not mean lawful. And also, what are you saying about unlawful hacking? So they were inherently saying that anything the state does is lawful, and anything else carried out by other parties is unlawful hacking. So they, they even tried to make that distinction. So I think it's we have to come to a consensus about how we like chip by chip earn back what those terms mean and, and redefine that. But it, it can be even worse. But this is very important because um, we said it's not um, the term is important because if they said that what we are doing is just part of interception of communication, like he was doing, like the USB, we are not having remote access, then the legal rules that apply to that is different than um, what we want, like a precise legal authority for, for the use of these tools. Um, and the problem that I found is that because the police are saying that that's already authorized as part of interception of communication. Um, they are not understanding exactly all the ways that you can have remote access to a computer and infiltrate it. Uh, the public debate around the topic is almost inexistent because they think that they have the authority and they are not doing something wrong. And so there is no debate about it. Uh, and that's a really big problem. So definitions and what they actually talking about, it becomes very important uh, in order to define which is the legal authority for that, um, which is not. So it seems like uh, in, in many, from, from all the presentations so far, in many countries, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, there has been a recent attempt, recent attempt uh, to actually define uh, the kind of uh, surveillance uh, techniques. Uh, uh, which you can call uh, uh, accessing remotely uh, devices, malware, planting, hacking, which uh, there has been more uh, of an attempt to, to get to this uh, level of uh, um, definition, and that's one of the things that we have been uh, uh, challenging, for example, in, in the UK with the, the Investigative Power Act. While other countries seem to rely uh, to general, generic uh, sort of powers of interception, uh, and use that uh, uh, to allow this kind of uh, uh, techniques which have a particular uh, level of intrusiveness and particular concerns about uh, both the privacy and the security and the security of the systems. So, um, maybe there are people that want to also share information that they have in terms of uh, what they come across in terms of uh, the, the legislation and how these kind of powers are, uh, are legislated and authorized. Or any other questions you may have. <laughs> sure. Um, I have another question that may be related to it. Uh, my name is Charles Brown from the University of Edinburgh. Um, a number of people on the panel have talked about the, uh, the lack of oversight in the English countries, so on. The lack of oversight or insufficient oversight. And uh, we've had this discussion in the UK over the uh, Investigative Powers uh, Act and what kind 
Um, okay, Tom, and then Luis. Maybe you can repeat the gist of the oh, question. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I actually, I, um, my apologies. I should <laughs> repeat the questions because we are we are uh, we are videoing. So the question was about what kind uh, of oversight uh, um, would be uh, can do uh, to um, uh, for effective oversight of, of this kind of powers. <coughs> sorry, uh, Luis first, and then Tom. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Well. I forgot to mention a couple of things about our case that, that make this essential and, and that it's important to answer first. For example, in the NSO uh, malware cases, uh, the main suspect of conducting the attacks is the authority in charge of doing the investigation. So this, this is an example of the difficulties on this uh, and the fact that most malware uh, attacks don't, as I mentioned before, you don't, I mean, the, the government agent don't need uh, collaboration from anyone, from the telco or Apple or Microsoft. Or any, they can just go uh, directly, and that creates incentives for them to use them whenever they want to. So, so it's difficult, and particularly in, in places in, like Mexico where there's very weak institutions, uh, corruption, etc., and and where the difference between state actors and organized crime, for example, is blurry at best. Uh, so this, this creates a, a particular challenge that while we are trying to propose on, on, on legal reform, it's, it, we're trying to go a lot into details, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very brief, but you have the usual stuff like transparency, like judicial authorization, uh, also uh, independent supervision, that there's a, a, an agent that it's outside of the executive, that it's uh, um, doing uh, audits, Etc. Uh, the notification of the of of those that have been targeted. This notification can be delayed for purposes of not curtailing the effectiveness of the of the investigation. But we are also trying. We are also uh, uh, proposing very detailed uh, um, uh, measures on acquiring and using this. Uh, that there is le registries, for example, during the investigation. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this in front of the camera, but uh, <laughs> um, authority, I think this is, they have already made this public. Authorities are saying that there's no records on who they spied on, who, they, who uses the malware, and, who, and there are no records or, or, or that can be audited on, on how this malware is being used. This is probably untrue, but still, uh, this, this should be also regulated. Who you, there should be registries on, on what malware do you purchase, who is authorized to use those malware, and agents with names, uh, and there should be uh, um, chains of custody on not only who, who accesses and uses the, the tools, but also who uh, handles the intelligence obtained by, by the use of those tools. Like, th there should be very, very strict regulation on, on how you acquire and use uh, these tools. But this that's regulation, that's not oversight or compliance with regulation. Yes, but, 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 but if you don't have that, it doesn't matter if you have very honest and independent oversight mechanisms if there's no registry for you to do an investigation on. So these are, are, are prerequisites for, for oversight. If you don't have uh, uh, registries and, and <coughs> regulation on who uses and acquires these tools, it doesn't matter what oversight you have. Okay, Tom, um, yeah. and um, yeah, and a lot of others. Yeah. <laughs> 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 relatively short. All right, yeah, I will, I will try. So I, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say you need holistic oversight. No, but you need oversight before, during, and after the operation. So what you need, what I think, what Mr. Freedom thinks that that uh, you should need, or what we need is like um, over, making sure that there's proper exposed and exempt oversight. So make sure that there's a proper validation procedure before uh, and such a operation can start. Uh, and also make sure that um, whenever there's a proper uh, 
use of a vulnerability, for example, that there's um, that there's been a separate check of the use of the vulnerability, so so that there will be said, all right, um, that there, for example, is a is a specific procedure procedure for the use of vulnerabilities, because um, a, a judge in a, in a specific investigation is not really able to um, to say whether a vulnerability is actually allowed to use or not. So I think that that you should have like a, a separate uh, committee to uh, uh, give, to, to grant the ability to use your vulnerability, for example. Mm -hmm. Then, um, and I will keep it re sure. relatively yeah. short, um, you need a proper uh, auditing of the code. Uh, you need to make sure that the malware, the, the police malware, uh, is being checked before it's used, and, it's also, and you also need to make sure that the results that you're getting are uh, reliable, which means that you need to have a, a, a lot of tech technical expertise, that, that the oversight committee isn't just um, uh, uh, isn't just consisting out of legal people, but also a lot of uh, technical people. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, automated oversight, for example, to make sure that uh, malware uh, cannot be used um, uh, without someone from the oversight committee actually uh, allowing uh, the operation to start. Um, Obviously, uh, after the uh, after the operation, you uh, uh, you need to have uh, in, in terms of your desk notification access to a court. It's very important to educate judges. Um, and lastly, obviously, uh, it all starts and ends and ends with logging. You need to make sure that uh, a police officer cannot use this kind of malware or or isn't uh, able to hack without uh, a system noticing it. So okay. that's that's how I would see oversight. Um, what else have we got? This? Fab, oh. do you want to say? Uh, Fabio, yeah. um, Scarlett, <laughs> uh, Fukami, and Maria. Okay, go. Uh, ju just quickly to share the experience in the attempt to uh, make a comprehensive legislation about that in Italy. Uh, the overs for the oversight, uh, we identified the need uh, written in uh, the law, the bill proposal, to have a national Trojan registry because we were concentrating on. Uh, the, uh, the 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 software that collect the information and the kind of information that it can collect and uh, having a, because in the proposal we went uh, uh, we went uh, regulating strictly the uh, trojan that can collect the information through a source code deposit and the certification process of each version being produced uh, each version being created for infection and each version being uh, installed because when uh, uh, a Trojan installed can change its uh, fingerprint, its cryptographic representation of the binaries in order to give those data in an independent national Trojan registry so that it can be acquired by the defendant party during the judicial process in order to check that exactly this Trojan authorized by this judge, uh, used by this prosecutor with this capability, by this producer of this version has been used and then being able to ask to the uh, provider to uh, reproduce through a reproducible build, including the source code audit, this process. But this to give all these kind of guarantees to the defendant parties, not only to an independent oversight body. That's a di different Thank approach. You. Scarlett? Um, so in our report on the 10 minimum safeguards that we think are necessary, we have a commentary in the back. Um, so one of our safeguards addresses oversight and transparency, and our commentary includes both a legal commentary that explains where the legal basis from for some of our safeguards comes from. It also includes implementation notes that tries to provide guidance on implementation. So with respect to oversight, and this is, I think, basically a base, like baseline guidance, um, we talk about how the UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism has talked about um, what oversight entails in the intelligence context, and we think this is quite useful as a baseline. Um, so an effective system of oversight includes at least one civilian institution independent of both the intelligence service and services and the executive. In some contexts, this has been um, interpreted to include parliamentary committees, although there's been um, discussion in the international human rights system about how sometimes they can be subject to regulatory capture by the agencies. You can also see in certain systems a completely independent civilian agency that's not part of parliament. Um, in terms of the coverage of those mechanisms, the special rapporteur observed they should consider all aspects of the work of the services, including their compliance with the law, effectiveness and efficiency of their activities, their finances and their administrative practices, they need power, resources, and expertise to initiate and conduct their own investigations ad hoc, 
as well as full and unhindered access to the information, officials, and installations necessary to fulfill their mandates. Um, and they should receive the full cooperation of agencies in hearing witnesses, as well as obtaining documentation and other evidence. Um, you see this, in, for example, in the US with the subpoena power by certain congressional committees. Um, and in addition, the Special Rapporteur noted that oversight mechanisms should publish annual reports in addition to having ad hoc investigatory powers describing their activities and findings, as well as incidental reports related to their ad hoc investigations. Um, and we've also noted that um, in the surveillance context, it's really important for mechanisms to be able to consult persons with technical expertise in the relevant technologies, as well as persons with expertise in privacy and human rights. Again, we would consider these basically baseline conditions for an effective oversight mechanism. It's not comprehensive. There are probably other um, bits and pieces that you could add to make it much more robust. But that's kind of as the UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism has elucidated these would be what we consider the necessary minimum aspects of um, uh, a satisfactory oversight mechanism. Thank you. Um, for me, the impossibility to actually have uh, a working oversight is one reason to be against Gerald Higging at all. So I, because I, I, I strongly believe it is impossible because um, First of all, all of the discussion or arguments that I hear are uh, completely missing the fact how this really works. It's not that someone has, oh, I have a malware, I know I planned it somewhere. It's much more complex. It involves much, you know, like, mu much more uh, li like, like ways of, of getting access than just this. Um, and at the end, it all ends up in, you know, like, like, like who at the end, uh, uh, at the end, decides uh, what to, pu to put into um, a config file. And um, this is like, this is really not, you, you, you can't get uh, meaningful oversight over it. It's impossible. Is your point is technically too complicated or is, or is it the fact that oversight okay. on, on law enforcement is, is Let's take one simple example. So um, one, one idea is uh, to talk about the Trojans itself. So what, what vulnerabilities are allowed to be used by law enforcement? Or like, you know, we have a simple, uh, we had the case with, uh, with WannaCry, so where we had like a Windows, whatever, you know, like ancient uh, bug that infected um, a vital amount of IT. So is this like, and if you have a discussion about that, inside policy, government, and civil society, or whomever we are talking to, is that legitimate or not to use? This is all a question of imagination, how difficult or like how problematic that is. I say we had a lot of luck. Thanks. So like that, that, that the world is still existing. <laughs> um, you know, because of the fact that is known f uh, to an agency for more than another decade. And this is like, this is one example. How do you deal with it? The person who is go and are going to deal with it that doesn't know about it but has to judge is a target of foreign surveillance. You can bet this person needs to be protected in a way that is almost impossible. You know, so, so you have like a lot of, you know, like additional problems to the oversight mechanisms um, just for you know, like the, the, the legal aspects, the technical aspects, and everybody who is involved in this. So this, for me, is, the main, is, is one of the main reasons to say we can't handle it in a legal way. So that's the reason why it should be outlawed in general. Spoil, sorry to spoil the fun, but this is like really our thing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just one, you wanted to say something as yeah. well, Marie? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to say that besides the technical advice that these type of committees should have, I think that is fundamental the access to information the, these oversight committees will have. Because, for example, in the case of Colombia, I told you we have a committee that was created within the Congress. It is not working yet. But the problem of this committee is that they are just allowed to access to the information given by the agencies. So no matter if it is classified or not classified, they should be able to review every single piece of information these agencies have. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, 
draw a line on the oversight aspects, but on, on some of these issues, the, the next panel will also touch upon, including around uh, vulnerabilities and how to deal with that. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop there. We have another five minutes if there is uh, any question. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to know, uh, the privacy aspect is one interesting aspect and the danger that uh, comes to the system, but what interests me is what if I identify my system has been attacked, I don't know by whom, if it's a criminal or someone else, and I have to invest uh, in investigating what happened. So who pays uh, for this investigation if uh, this was an alleged hack? I cannot know if it was legend or not. So do I have to invest uh, thousands of euros myself to find out if I was a legal target or uh, if it was a criminal activity? So the question is, uh, um, if you are uh, subject to an attack of, of the sort of, uh, sort of malware uh, and you need to investigate uh, where that attack comes from, or whether yeah. it is legal or not legal? What happened? Uh, yeah. What was affected? Uh, so, if I have uh, personal data on my system, mm -hmm. I'm required to uh, identify what data was stolen, who has uh, access to it, inform the people whose data has been accessed. And so, I do have to do investigation. <laughs> it was a legend hack. Uh, who reimburses me for the... Uh, That's a very good question. Budget, yeah. budget, right? <laughs> okay, uh, briefly, uh, Tom, um, I don't know if anyone else wants to yeah. respond to this. So in, in the Netherlands, there's, la there's, there's this has also been part of the debate because a lot of uh, companies were very afraid. Uh, and um, if the government, if, if, if the police messes up, the police has to pay. So there will be a specific uh, uh, sort of procedure for that. So if they break your computer, then they basically need to pay. Uh, unless, obviously, when you were a legitimate target, then the situation is different because, well... Yeah, what, what's the... Okay, what's the situation then? So you, you are going to try to attack <coughs> someone, like, as a police, and then you break uh, a piece of, of, of uh, yeah. hardware uh, that is from a suspect that might be legitimate targeted. But still, they break, like, you know, it's like... What's happening then? <coughs> they pay for the computer or what? Well, none of it's a legitimate suspect. It's the same when the police uh, br yeah, but enters, but enters into a house. If they, if, if, if they need to have, like, if, if they need, for example, I don't know, if, if they need to open the door and they, and they demolish the door. But it's different because sometimes you have to thank someone to go to the real target, right? But there are two things different. Cases. There are two things different. One thing is uh, when someone gets into your house to break it, Mm -hmm. There's a there's a, a, um, a, a witness like in almost yeah. all countries that I know there is like a, a procedure where you ha have to have a witness yeah. that breaks into your house. You don't have that if if like a person breaks your computer. What's like the the the, the thing? I, I They're not going to say that they were. Uh, I, uh, I understand the difference, but but the idea is that um, uh, whenever you you were a legitimate suspect um, and the police had, had legitimate cause to enter your device, uh, the, 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 the damage that has been done is obviously between, uh, if it's reasonable and we can debate for hours about what's reasonable what not, and, and, and what's not reasonable, then it's <coughs> um, basically the target's own, uh, the, 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 the suspect's own res responsibility. Because I, I'm a suspect, that's what that, what, what, what legislation is that? <laughs> so I'm a suspect, so I have to pay for all of the problems that I cause. Guys, if there is any attack on companies through malware, they will first start going out to the police to send them the bill, because it may have been the police. So that may be a very interesting <laughs> yeah. effect popping up. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, that's, but that's when it's a company. Yeah, but also when you are uh, a private person, you probably co could could start to sue them as well, just for you because you can you can suspect. This is the only legitimate way that can be there. So uh, two, two things I can figure out uh, if I'm a suspect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because this is what you say. This is actually reverse engineering suspects. Um, guys, I, I think we are kind of getting to the end of the session. It doesn't mean that you couldn't continue the conversation. We you have uh, 15 minutes before uh, the next session starts, which will also uh, touch upon some of, some of these issues. Um, well, I'd just like to thank everyone for their contribution and participation. And maybe just